Hello everybody and welcome back to Water Child Tarot. My name is Sarah and it's been a little while. Um, October just turned into sort of an insanely crazy month with lots to do. Um, it didn't afford me a lot of time to sit down and make little videos. But uh, here we are um, and we're going to talk about Oracle decks today. Something that I don't spend a lot of time on on this channel. Um, I don't have that many and I don't use them very often. I'm still sort of finding my way with how I want to use Oracle um, to do readings or for you know contemplation or that kind of thing. Um, but I've been thinking about this uh, a little bit more recently um, and actually picked up a new deck and have some problems with it. So we're going to talk about sort of a critique of Oracle in general, what I look for in Oracle decks, what, what I like, and then maybe some plans for how I'm going to work with some of these. All right, so this is the first deck I want to discuss, and it's one that has proven to be unsatisfactory for my needs, um, and I'll explain why. So this is the Holly Va Hollow Valley deck of symbols, um, and I also have the guidebook that was published uh, along with it, but uh, was purchased separately. Um, it's by Aaron uh, Isle, I assume is how you pronounce this person's name. Um, and to be fair, I have not really read the guidebook, but I, I went through the deck a couple of times and found a bunch of stuff that annoyed me, and so I have just decided to pass this on without spending a lot of time on it. Um, now, what I will say about this deck is that I really like the artwork, and that's what drew me to get it in the first place. Um, I like this style of simple uh, line drawing or pen and ink um, that does have enough detail that you can sort of tell what you're looking at, but that is not overly complicated. I like the black and white factor here. Um, I seem to enjoy black and white on an oracle deck more than I do on a tarot. I think on the tarot it's kind of not rich enough for me and I'm not really um, getting enough out of the imagery to do interpretation, but um, in an oracle there is this quality of just kind of going with your first impression um, and so that is uh, you know something that I can kind of work with more easily. Um, now this deck does incorporate plants as you'll see and I believe all the plants are explained in the guidebook, the plant choices. Um, not all cards have a plant so for example this owl card does not have a plant associated with it but you'll see that most of these do have um, a plant association. And some of them look a little bit like tarot cards. For example the tide card with this um, crustacean here of course reminds me of the moon. Um, and then you get a few others that you might be able to pick out. There's a tower card um, you know, the lantern could be reminiscent of the hermit, for example. Um, and I like some of the choices, you know, teeth is a good one. Um, and then there's spine. So there's a couple of different body parts. And then there's other concepts. One of the things that could be improved is that certain cards, I feel, could have a corresponding card. And some of the cards are duplicated. So a card that would use a corresponding card, for example, it might be poison. You could have a card for antidote. Um, or let's say, you know, lantern, right? You could have darkness. Um, so there, there are things like that where I feel like you could have um, the, the yin and the yang or um, that kind of thing incorporated in here, and it would give you a broader range of ideas for readings. Um, the other thing that this deck does not do a good job of is that there's a lot of repetition. So, for example, you saw the well card earlier, and there's also a vessel card and a cup card. Now, I'm not sure that there's very much difference, enough difference in these three cards to warrant three separate um, spaces in this deck. Um, particularly with cup and vessel. I realize that those are like subtle interpretations of similar ideas, um, but I think they could go together in one card. And then well is the source of whatever goes in the cup and the vessel. So maybe that goes with it, but the way it's depicted here is again, vessels, vessels, vessels. So this gets kind of repetitive and this is not a huge deck. 
it's definitely less than 80 cards. So there's not a lot of room, in my opinion, for this kind of repetition. And it's not just that set of cards that is I find repetitive. For example, Spiral and Cave have similar imagery. Um, neither of these cards particularly does well in describing the word. Um, so here you have spiral, but the actual spiral is very small, and we mostly are looking at either a sheep's um, a sheep's head uh, with or skull, um, moons, and um, some kind of plant life here. Here we have the concept of cave, which is sort of indicated by this line drawing at the top, but not really. That doesn't exactly look like a cave. It looks like rocks or a mountain to me. Um, and then again, this spiral shape. So if you had the word spiral on a snail card, that would work better for me. Here again, you have three cards that are very similar in imagery and in concept. Um, I think you could encapsulate one, use one card to encapsulate all three of these ideas. So you have moon um, with just a circle, and we'll see in the sun card um, also uses just a plain circle to represent a celestial body. So this particular thing is not differentiated. Um, and then you have a luna moth here, um, which I get, you know, the, the name is in the title, so you're gonna put a luna moth on the moon card. Okay, nothing wrong with that by itself. But then you have a moth card with a moth that looks very much like this luna moth. It's got slightly different markings on it, but it's very similar. Um, and then, and some moon representations down here. And then you have the metamorphosis card, which shows a moth going from a caterpillar to a chrysalis into a full-blown moth. Now, why couldn't you just encapsulate all of this into a moth card, for example? Um, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me why you need three cards that sort of overlap so much in a limited deck. Here again, you have spider slash web, and then you have net, um, two very similar concepts with very similar kinds of drawings. Another example is the sun and the garden cards. Again, we just have circles, so um, we don't know if this is the sun or the moon. It's different things on different cards, but it looks exactly the same. And then in the sun card, we have this celestial body and a flower. And in the garden card, we have a celestial body and flowers. So how are these different? Yes, they're different card, uh, different kinds of flowers. I understand that. But it's not enough different to really give me different information, give me anything to really work with in a deep way. Um, and, it, and it annoys me. So, right, so the, these cards are going to pop up and then suddenly um, I'm just going to be angry at them and <laughs> instead of like trying to figure out what, you know, what kind of a story I can tell myself about them. Um, here uh, you have actually four cards that overlap in a strange way based on the imagery, not so much the keywords. Um, so each of these fe features hands and um, hands in different positions to represent different things that to me they don't represent. So dismemberment um, is one of the most disturbing cards in this deck and it's really an outlier. There's no other card that uh, depicts violence or illness or um, you know, this kind of a, a energy here. So that's kind of a weird outlier for that reason. Hand is just sort of a little too, I don't know, basic. You could, you could just call this palm because I think here valley probably represents, you know, the, the inner part of a hand um, where the lines are in your palm. So if you're going to make a reference to like fortune telling or palm reading, um, you could just call this palm. And then you have um, what looks like palms here. I can't quite tell. And then uh, mountain, again, is represented. Yes, there's this vague representation up here of mountain, but most of the card is taken up with this asterisk symbol, whatever plant this is, and then hands in the shape of a mountain, um, which doesn't do a lot for me. Um, I just find it kind of confusing. And then for my last example here, again, you have two cards that are very similar, um, very similar imagery. So here you have a palm with a crown, and then you have a crown with palm and then weapons. So I don't know what this what this artist was trying to do. Um, I'm sure if I read the book that they would explain to me what they were trying to do, but visually they didn't get there um, with differentiating these cards. So this deck sort of fails on a few levels. It fails to um, explain itself visually in, in relation to the keywords, um, and it fails in the sense of being too repetitive over 
uh, multiple cards around a single concept. So for that reason, I'm going to be passing on the Holly Val Hollow Valley deck of symbols. And I, you know, I don't want to pick on this deck particularly too much. It's the one that I've spent the most time on, but I've done, um, I've, I've looked at other decks that have a similar kind of approach. Um, the Postcards from Liminal Space comes to mind, and that one, you know, has a similar kind of vibe to it. But again, it's like some cards are very specific, some cards are very broad. A lot of cards feel like they should have a partner card in the deck, and they don't. Um, and a lot of the concepts were sort of overlapping, so I, I got that one, and I think I almost immediately sold it. Um, just because I wasn't, I wasn't jiving with it. Um, let's look at two other decks that I think do a better job and that I am looking forward to uh, working with. Um, and these oracles do not have words on them, so that automatically eliminates a lot of problems that I have with in terms of keywords or mismatch between the word and the concept or the word and the image that's used. Um, we'll start with this one. This is the Bats Blood Ink Oracle cards by Monica Bodersky, uh, famously of the Shadowlands Tarot, um, and she's done a number of other decks. And this is a cute little deck. Um, but these are the backs. I do not like the text on the backs, but oh well. Um, you don't really spend that much time looking at the backs anyway. Let's look at the fronts. So these cards, I'll have to hold them up a little bit. Um, are cute. They just depict characters in different situations, and they're just numbered for a convenient reference. So if you were to say do a reading and draw some cards, you could write down the numbers and then be able to refer back to which cards you've gotten. Um, there are no titles, there are no keywords. And this deck definitely has a Halloween vibe. You know, you've got mummy here, you've got this like cat, um, cat child in a Halloween costume with a little thing of candy here. So perfect for this time of year and I will probably bring this with me on my Halloween reading um, session that I'm going to be doing right around uh, Samhain time. Um, but you know if you're in a sort of a spooky mood um, you could certainly use this anytime like dentures with fangs. I just I, I love like the humor here um, and I think this is pretty open to interpretation and there's not a lot of repetition. Um, there's some repetition like this is also a kid with a candy thing. Let me find that other one. You know, so maybe these come up in a pair or something, who knows. Um, but they're a little bit different. This is a skeleton in a rabbit costume. Um, and this is just a cat in like a person costume. So there's a little bit of repetition, but not nearly as much as I see in many other decks. And um, these are just fun characters doing goofy things. We'll see how much um, use I actually get out of it as a reading deck. But uh, I love the imagery, and this is the only Monica Podersky deck that I've had. I like her artwork a lot, but in terms of the way she relates images to um, concepts in the tarot, for example, I can't quite get with it um, on a few cards, and so this is the only deck that I have because the other ones that she's produced just don't quite work for me um, enough in a, in a nagging way that it's a problem. But this one is cute and doesn't bother me. Um, even a little bit of repetition is kind of okay in the imagery. So yeah, <laughs> it's like, this is great. Like it's it's chicken soup, right? It's like a container that has chicken feet on it, but it's a ladle and there's nice, you know, nice smelling warm broth in here. Um, so yeah, I, I really like this. It's weird, it's quirky. Um, and there's no there's no keywords to get in the way. Um, I just realized I don't know what those are, but those could be teeth. Um, and and the teeth card was my favorite one in the Hollow Valley uh, deck of symbols. So maybe we can pretend that those are teeth, and I can have my tooth card after all. Okay, so another um, sort of similar in some ways. Again, uh, black and white decks and, and oracle for some reason with me. Um, this is the Stitcher's Oracle, and who is this by? You didn't put your name on the box, I can't tell who you are. Um, anyway, these are the backs. Um, this is on a really nice linen finish, professional cardstock. I will say that this cardstock, eh, it's, it's kind of cereal boxy, but that's okay. 
but this is really nice cardstock. I love the design here. And as the name of this, the Stitcher's Oracle implies, this has to do with um, handcraft and you know fabric and fiber arts. So you've got knitting needles, a crochet hook, scissors, um, other implements here, and you'll see other implements in the deck. Here's some cross stitch. Um, all of the cards have this border, so you have a um, crescent moon, a star, and then up here this little like skull guy um, who's also either wearing or holding a ball of yarn and is also kind of a pin cushion. Um, and I just think it's a cute little touch. It does make it, it gives it that like witchy kind of Halloween vibe um, along with the little um, doodads in the background, you know, the, the little I don't know, embellishments or sparkly things um, that she's put in here. Um, and then you get different things. So this is like seam rippers and a thimble and some thread. And this is a hand, you know, holding um, a knitting needle and wrapping the yarn around. And again, you don't have any keywords. Um, and these aren't even numbered. So it would be a little difficult to maybe refer back to this if you were to draw some cards and do a reading. I might just date my reading and then take a picture. Um, if I was going to do this, here's a bunch of buttons, um, but I can pull things out of um, out of this deck without any problem with the different images. So you know, this gives you kind of three of swords vibes, maybe, um, but it's it's not necessarily a sad card. It's just you know a ball of yarn with some implements stuck into it. You have um, multiple bobbins cards, but you know there's a big difference between this depiction of a bobbin and needles, and then this depiction of bobbins. So. I think this one, while there is a certain repetition in the kinds of um, activities that are being depicted, I think that the way that they're depicted gives you enough range um, to sort of differentiate them. So again, I might only draw one card to go with a reading, um, but that's probably how I will use this deck. And I have a tarot that I would probably use it with, and that's the yarn tarot. I've showed this on my channel before. Let's just look at a few cards together. So. And I think the color palette is neutral enough on the oracle that it can sort of go with anything. Um, the idea of bringing an oracle deck in alongside a tarot deck for a reading could be pretty cool, um, especially if you did a bunch of um, uh, tarot tarot cards and then um, you know an oracle card to either like focus the reading or explain a card or something like that. Um, I wouldn't do equal numbers of cards with these decks, so I guess this. This was kind of in order, um, this tarot deck, which I didn't realize. Anyway, I think these look cool together. And, you know, again, thematically, um, they're both related to like fiber arts and stitching and that. So um, I think with some practice, this is going to be an interesting combination. And then, as I said, I'm planning to use this deck for Halloween reading since I'll show it alongside some of the decks that I'll uh, use for those. This is the Triumphi della Luna by Patrick Valenza, and it is the paradoxical blue edition, so it has this like negative photo effect. Um, but it has a bit of a, a peachy gold in it, um, and both have you know black um, in them, so I think this can work. It's a little bit unusual looking. Sorry, I just realized my light was very glary there. Maybe you can see that a little bit better. Um, yeah, I kind of like I kind of like the way this looks together. It's a, a bit of a surprise. Let's see how it plays with another deck. Let's try my very my Halloweeniest Halloween deck is this um, Nightmare Before Christmas tarot, based on the art by Minerva Siegel, originally based on the stop motion animation by. Tim Burton and Danny Elfman. Um, oh, I like this. Because the gold kind of picks up the oranges in this deck. So, and again, you get a lot of black and white here. Yeah, this is cool. I like it, I like it. This is good. So, yeah. I mean, I couldn't tell you what cat plus um, wrapping your yarn around the needle exactly means, but you know, I'm sure I could come up with a good story um, in context. And again, I probably wouldn't use equal numbers of cards. I would just do a tarot reading, either draw a card and then do a tarot reading around it, or do a tarot reading and then use one of these cards to kind of wrap it up at the end. Um, okay, so 
that's this Oracle deck and uh, I look forward to using it more. And let's go back and look at this little guy and see how it works with the Nightmare Before Christmas deck. So we're back in Monica Bodersky land here um, with her weird characters. And this deck actually has a lot of weird characters in it too. So I'm thinking these guys might get along pretty well. Yeah, I like this. So you get the idea there. And then one more tarot deck we can try. And this is Tarot of the Sweet Twilight, produced by Los Carabeo. Um, the artwork is actually by Christina Benintende. And this one also has, I mean, that's clearly Johnny Depp, right? Do we all agree that that's Johnny Depp? Um, so it's got this kind of Tim burton -y feel. Oh yeah, this is great. I like this even better than the uh, Nightmare Before Christmas, actually. I think this is going to be a good pairing. So note to self, um, people who pick the Sweet Twilight deck will get the Oracle reading with the Bat's Blood ink. Um, this is super cool. I like, I really like the way these go together. So yeah, that's, that's that um, basically. And I know that a lot of people use Tarot and Oracle together in this way, you know, pairing them up. Um, side by side and either using the oracle as a focus or a clarification or you know just like a, a summary even an advice you know or next steps kind of a card um so that could be pretty cool so that's it for me for pairings i think um i don't think either of the next two decks that i'm going to show you i would really particularly pair um with anything else i'd probably use them on their own so let's take a look at those so just a quick recap so far um we've looked at the Hollow Valley deck of symbols, we looked at the Bat's Blood ink, and we've looked at the Stitcher's Oracle. Um, and one thing I wanted to point out about all of these is they're really symbol decks um, to me. They're, they're for interpretation on a symbolic level. And sometimes that works well with an additional keyword and oftentimes not. Um, and my, my brain tends to wanna to go over here with no keywords. Um, because I think keywords uh, can be problematic in that we get stuck on them and we rely on them too heavily as defining what the card is and then we're not we're sort of limiting our creativity or intuition i like a specific quote from aaron morgenstern um, who wrote the night circus which is a book that i greatly enjoyed um, she wrote another one recently called the starless sea that's kind of getting mixed reviews and it's very long so i'm probably not going to read that one uh, but my mom read it and liked it and she um she pulled out a couple of quotes that I thought were fun. One is, symbols are for interpretation, not definition. And I absolutely, 100%, 1000% agree with that. Um, and I'll say it again. Symbols are for interpretation, not definition, right? So you're not memorizing symbols on tarot cards and then spitting them back out um, when you do a reading. You're not memorizing keywords that go with symbols and spitting out keywords. Um, if you're a good reader, you are interpreting the symbols in the situation in which they appear. So related to the question, related to the other cards around it, um, read the room, you know, related to the client in front of you or the friend in front of you or to yourself or your own mood or, you know, however you're doing this reading. That's what, how you're interpreting the symbols in that case. Um, a spoon doesn't always mean the same thing. A flame doesn't always mean the same thing. A bat doesn't always mean the same thing. Um, a needle uh, stabbed into a ball of yarn doesn't always mean exactly the same thing. That's why it's a symbol, not a keyword. So that's kind of where I am in general with Oracle and particularly with um, Oracles that don't function so well. I feel like that's where the breakdown lies often. Um, so let's look at some other kinds of oracles that function in a different way. And we'll start here um, with James Ede's Cosmovisions Tarot uh, and Oracle. Um, or oracle and Tarot, or tarot -oracle, um is one way to look at that. So this is a deck that um, complies with standard tarot structure. It has 78 cards. It um, has 22 uh 
main cards or, or you know cards that are set aside in another suit. Um, it has four other suits and it has um, not exactly what you would call court cards but it has um, this kind of card which is like um, roles you know uh, or actors you know pe people characters who um, act in a certain way. And so those are kind of stand-ins for the court cards. So it absolutely can be read just as a tarot. Um, it does start in a different place in the Major Arcana than maybe what we are used to. So it starts with zero, but instead of zero being the Fool, zero is death. Um, but if you think about the Fool card as being the start of a new beginning, um, this works very well. So each of the major arcana are linked up with their corresponding uh, major arcana in a traditional tarot. And uh, for example, this is the cosmic tree. It's um, linked with the hermit. And so you can see, you know, some kind of relation there, both to me and the imagery and this idea of being old and withdrawn and alone. But also um, in the book, uh, James Eads gives you those those things. Like here we've got the peacock for the empress, we've got abundance, we've got beauty, we've got, you know, this beautiful garden um, here, and so you have you have those linkages. Um, and then the suits again are different, and then you have these um, actors kind of cards, like the composer um, and that kind of thing. So this works really well um, as a tarot, but it also can work as an oracle. Um, I think it can can work um, for contemplation. It can work for, again, maybe you could pull an extra card at the end of a reading with a different deck and just pull one card from this deck to kind of wrap up a reading or give you an extra message. I think it could work that way. I don't know if I'll use it that way. I'll probably just use this basically as a tarot, um, but I, I like it. Uh, I like the the artwork is why I got it. Um, again, it's I've been wanting a James Eads deck for a long time, and this is the one that makes sense to me. This is the one that kind of clicked with my understanding of tarot reading and of uh, imagery and symbolism and all of that. And I love, you know, being a Buddhist, I love that lotuses is one of the suits that he replaced. So that's very cool. That is the Cosmovisions, and you could use it um, either as a tarot or an oracle or sort of both as a hybrid deck. So that's pretty cool. Um, there are other uh, decks out there that, that are similar. Um, so the Dreams of Gaia um, is one that I know of that has its own structure, but it also kind of works as a tarot. Um, and I think there are a few others. Um, if you have others or work with others, feel free to leave a, a comment down below with those um, in case folks are interested. And so, um, so that's another kind of Oracle deck. And then the last one, and probably the most common, is what I would call inspirational deck. Um, and so here I have the Buddhism reading cards. These are brand new to me. Um, my mother was actually getting rid of some decks and yesterday I was going through her discard pile and she had a couple of different Buddhist related um, decks in there and I really like these. So I asked her if I could keep them rather than reselling them and she graciously said yes. Um, so this is the Buddhism reading cards, Wisdom for Peace, Love and Happiness by Sofan Chan. And I really don't know anything about this deck um, in terms of facts. I have not read the guidebook, so I don't know if that's any good. Um, but what I do like is that these cards are very large, and they're great for um, reviewing important concepts in Buddhism. So on the, the fronts, which, I don't know, to me these are like the backs, actually, um, but each one is different. Um, so you get a, a one side of each card that has art on it, and a lot, many of them are just faces of Buddha in different aspects. Um, there you get a few cards that, that show other things important to Buddhism, like lotus flowers. Um, and not all of them are differentiated. So I, I would not actually use this deck to do readings in terms of multiple cards, because there's very little differentiation um, in terms of what the imagery depicts. It's just lots of artist interpretations of various Buddhas in you know, the, the poses do mean something, you know, the hand gestures mean something, those are all um, significant. But if you don't know that, if you're not familiar with Buddhism, or you don't know the mudras, um, that may not mean very much to you. And 
I'm not sure it's entirely important in this context. It's important in Buddhism and um, Buddhist art, but in terms of this deck, these are just pretty pictures to look at. Uh, the, the meat and potatoes and the best part of this deck is this side, um, which is a concept, um, a quote, uh, and then a little, you know, sort of um, elaboration on that concept. And from my experience, this is a very popular kind of deck. Um, I would call this an inspirational deck as opposed to sort of a, a concept deck, um, which is what the, the deck of symbols is. So rather than a big image with a keyword or a key phrase or a quote or something like that, which would be like this, um, here you actually have the concept is the most important thing and then you have elaborations on that concept. And in some ways, these are like flashcards. Um, they're reminders of what these concepts are, why they're important, um, and how they fit into a Buddhist practice. So I find these helpful because I'm a beginning Buddhist. I've been studying in earnest for just over a year now. And a lot of these concepts um, at face value can sort of overlap, like pure understanding and wisdom. You know, those those two might seem on the surface to overlap, but they are distinct and they have distinct functions and qualities. So that's helpful. Um, I like that there's quotes from famous teachers here. So we're not just relying on some author, um, but we are actually pulling this back into the, the Dharma directly through these direct quotes from um, Buddhist teachers down the lineage. And then you do have... Um, these concepts that are clearly written to me uh, by somebody who has um, a similar understanding to Buddhism as what I've been learning. Um, so I'm not going to um, say that one interpretation or way of teaching these concepts is better than another because I am not a Buddhist teacher um, and that is not my place. But in terms of what my teacher has taught me, uh, these really resonate. So that is helpful to me um, and just reminding me, you know, what, what does generosity entail? Um, we have an idea of it, but um, where is its place in my spiritual practice and my daily life um, and that kind of thing. So I like this deck a lot for that reason and I can see why this kind of deck could be very popular. Um, you know, there's there's things like messages from the angels or messages from magical pink rainbow unicorns or, um, you know, your your heart and soul uh, daily desire or, you know, decks like that. Um, and I can see why those are popular. Again, for me, the artwork is like, it's pretty bright and in your face. Um, and you can certainly use this, pull one out and put it on your practice space um, or your meditation space and then kind of use it as a visual aid. Um, but I really see the value of this as being in the text part of it. Um, so that that is that. Um, in terms of, you know, how th the popularness of oracles, it seems to be that this kind of an oracle and this kind of an oracle are the two most popular um, types of cards out there on the market today. And it's funny because in general, neither of these really does it for me. Um, they're both problematic. Um, I've, I've made fun of Oracle decks in the past as being, you know, sort of motiv motivational cat posters, a deck of motivational cat posters um, with sort of banal and trite um, advice or, you know, uplifting messages um, that really don't resonate and just come across as too saccharine um, and, uh, you know, not really specific enough or not really um, relevant to me. Either you have something that is, um, you know, a concept and then a lot of exposition about that. Um, and I would rather usually get this in book form than in a deck of cards. Um, I don't find this very helpful typically, and I wouldn't read, I wouldn't do a reading with this. Um, but like I said, these, uh, for me, in this specific instance, instance work as reinforcement on other reading that I'm doing. So that's why I like this specific deck. 
it ties in with something else that I'm working on or trying to learn. And so they do become like flashcards for me more than like inspirational things. Um, and then over here in this um, hollow valley, uh, you know, this is pretty typical of having some symbols on a card and then maybe a keyword or key phrase. This is also very popular, but again, I often find problems either because I don't interpret the symbols to go with that keyword very well or um, there's all kinds of repetition and other issues that I brought up before. So I prefer no words at all and just pictures and that seems to work a lot better for me. And I am very grateful that I found a couple of examples that I think will work for me well and I just understand that about myself now and I'm not you know, now I'm not tempted to buy Oracle decks or to try to get that to work because I realize that I'm not really the target audience for Oracle in general. And with a very few exceptions, these aren't going to work for me. But I'm glad that they, you know, seem helpful for other people. Um, I do feel like, uh, you know, in some cases they can be a bit of a crutch in terms of actually being able to read because they kind of hand you stuff. Um, and, you know, it's just read the message. That's the message. You know, you don't have to do any work. You don't have to do any inter interpretation. And I'm not sure what the point of that is um, if you're using your intuition to come up with a reading. But that said, you know, my way is not necessarily the best way. It's just the best way for me. Um, and so if you do use Oracle cards, I'd love to hear more about how you use them um, and, you know, which decks work for you uh, in order to get you to that place of, you know, clarity or um, remembering concepts or relating to something that's confusing. So yeah, let me know how you use Oracle in the comments. Let me know what your favorite Oracle decks are. Um, I'd be curious to know, especially among uh, my subscribers, because I do see Oracle decks discussed a lot on the broader internet or in, um, you know, tarot groups online. But um, in terms of what you guys actually use, I'd love to know more about that. So let me know um, how you use Oracle in your practice, if you do at all. And um, thanks again for watching, and I will see you very soon. Take care.